going to start this morning off with a lifting up a prayer to our, our Father in Heaven. Wait for a couple folks to grab a seat there. Please bow with me at this time. Dear great and awesome Father, we are so thankful that you have uh, continued to bless us and guide us. We're so thankful that you have watched over uh, this body, this church family here, dear Lord. Uh, we're thankful that you have given the wisdom and to our elders, to the ministers, dear Lord, and uh, the wives that support them. This day we come gathering in a larger number. May we lift up our voices and, and songs and as we sing the hymns, dear Lord, may our hearts be touched. May our hearts be encouraged. As we hear the sermon today, dear Lord, may as well, may it prick our hearts, may it move us, may it be a reminder of the great and awesomeness that you are, how you protect us and guide us, and you have purpose for each one of us, dear Lord. Thank you. That's just all the you know, fills my heart this day. Uh, may this day be awesome, and may it be pleasing to you from each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Glad to see everybody here. It's good to be together again. Start with number 144, O Worship the King. O worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. 238. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of lords. You are the mighty God. You are the king of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. Number 239. Oh boy. 
Well, let's get number 239 then, I guess. Thought I did something very in particular to make that not happen. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Oh, wow. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than all that we can ask for or imagine according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy and righteous Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this gathering. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus and for his perfect life and for his perfect sacrifice and for the life that you are giving us now through him. Father, we're thankful for gathering today in person and uh, online. We ask you, Father, to be with each one of us, to provide us with the kind of peace that we need to, to be able to think and, and to consider what your word says, that we would have, as always, Father, eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand what your Holy Spirit has revealed. Father, we ask for these things because we know that we need you. We know, Father, that we need your will to be done in our lives, and we ask you, Father, to give us the strength that we need to carry out your will in this world and to be your people in a way that represents you well and brings you honor. Father, thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we offer this prayer. Amen. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to just say a, a, a little technical word. We were supposed to be streaming this service, and uh, a few moments ago I just proved that I am uh, not a very, very good technician. Uh, apparently all of my practice yesterday, setting everything up for streaming, used all of our streaming service time. And I d it didn't tell me that until about five minutes before service. So whenever people are watching this video that we'll post later today online, uh, they'll understand that um, I am hopefully a better preacher than I am a technician. Uh, so now to get to the part of the stuff that I actually think I know how to do sometimes, let's look at what God's Word has to say. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open with me today to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. And we're going to uh, just spend a little bit of time there in a couple other places. Have you ever uh, prayed a prayer that sounds like this? Lord, if you will just. You ever started a prayer that way? Lord, Lord if you will just. And, and think about it. How would you finish that? Or how did you finish that opening of your prayer when you said, Lord, will you just? Uh, maybe it was in a hospital room and you had someone that you loved dearly that was suffering and you thought, well, Lord, if you will just heal this person that I love, right? then I will do whatever comes next, right? If you'll just do this, then I will do that. Uh, maybe you were uh, considering buying a home and you were praying to the Lord that you will get a mortgage. You know, if I would just get this mortgage, then everything's going to be okay. And if you'll just do this for me, Lord, then I will do that for you. Uh, maybe you were uh, looking, uh, maybe when you, so I'm looking at the age of our crowd here, maybe when you were much younger and you were looking at someone going, Lord, if you'll just give me this relationship, right? Uh, if I could just have this person in my life and they would just love me, if you would give me this, then I will do that for you. Well, I think that that's a common prayer and I think that we've all been uh, maybe guilty of offering that prayer and it's sort of a bartering type of prayer. You understand? It's bartering. I'm bartering with God. I'm saying, God, if you will do this for me, then I will do that for you. And we may be well-meaning in that. We may be in a time of suffering when we're asking those questions. We may be desperate. And I think that God understands all those situations. But there's something about those prayers that I think betrays what we really put our hope in. Okay? what we really put our hope in. And so sometimes in those prayers, what we're doing is we're asking God, saying, Lord, if you'll give me this thing that I, that I desire, right? And let's not confuse our words here today. Normally what we think of as hope is actually desire, right? Lord, if you give me this thing that I desire, then I will give you this thing that you desire, right? And so if you'll give me what I'm hoping for, what I desire, then I'll give you what you are hoping that I would give to you. 
in, in some sense, when we offer those kind of prayers, we're actually saying to God that I want to put my hope in this thing, and in return for that, I'm going to give you this other thing that you were wanting from me. And I think that in a sense, we've all been guilty of that, whether it's through our desire for a job or a career or for a relationship or an investment or a, a possession, a house, a car, whatever it is, we've, we've kind of had those things where we expressed in those prayers what we really put our hope in. Now, um, as a teaching point today, I want you to define hope a little bit differently than maybe you have, because sometimes what we do is we confuse the word hope uh, with desire, and that's a mistake. Hope is, is not desire. I mean, I have all kinds of desires, and I think that there's good desires and there's bad desires. That's besides the point. Today, I want you to define hope differently because the Bible gives us a word for hope that we, that we should remember and understand whenever we think about hope, and the word is expectation. The very same word in the Greek language that is translated hope is also translated expectation. Okay? And so when I am uh, giving something hope, or I have hope in something, I'm actually saying that I have an expectation of that something. And so hope is expectation, and any time we put our hope in something, we're expecting that it's going to do something in return for us. Um, have you ever heard or heard or maybe even said something like this? Uh, in a situation that you're in, you said to yourself, well, this is just hopeless. You ever said that? This is hopeless, right? Or maybe you've said, I just don't have any hope anymore. People have been through difficult circumstances in life. They turn around, they say things like, well, I just give up because I just don't have any hope anymore. It's hopeless, the situation that I'm in. And what they're really saying is that they simply don't have any expectations left right? I don't have any expectations left of this thing that I put my hope in. And all of those things that we put our hope in at some time or another generally let us down. They usually disappoint us, right? When I put my hope in a, in a relationship and that relationship falls apart, I think to myself, well, now it's hopeless, right? Because what I expected is no longer a possibility. Or if I said, you know, I put my hope in my things in this world or in the money that, that I have in this life, and, and, and that money is gone or that money's not serving me in the way that I expected it to, then I can say, well, then it's hopeless. Why? Because all the money's gone or because the money's not doing what I thought the money would do. If you get the point, you see what I'm saying is that anything in this world that we put our hope in or we have an expectation of has the potential to fail us, to let us down, and to leave us feeling and maybe actually leave us genuinely hopeless, where we say to ourselves or we say to others, I just don't have any hope anymore. They eventually let us down. They eventually wear us out. They eventually um, they leave us empty and they leave us hopeless. If something can disappoint you, and if you're making notes today, I'd like you to write this down. If something can disappoint you, then it's not worthy of your expectations. If something can disappoint you, if it can let you down, then it's not worthy of your expectations. What's my evidence? Romans chapter 5. We're going to try to define hope in a new way today that helps us understand why, uh, why there is a hope that we can have expectation of that is genuine and uh, true. In Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to read a bit of this, but there's really only one aspect of this that I want you to pay attention to today. It begins in verse 1. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Okay, so grace is this place in which we live, this place in which we stand, and we exult in uh, hope of glory, right? In hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. It's kind of weird that he would say that, but when we're going through difficult circumstances because of the hope that we have in God, we can rejoice in the midst of those, those tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proving character, and proving character, what does it bring? Are you looking at it with me in the Bible? It brings hope, right? And he says, and hope does not what? Hope does not disappoint. You see, when you place your hope in the things of this world that can let you down and disappoint you, then what you've really done is made a tremendous error. You've made a mistake because those things are not worthy of your hope. Only one thing is worthy of your hope. And he says that this hope doesn't disappoint for reason, and it doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
You see, hope is not derived from the things that we experience or the things that we possess in this life. Not from relationships, not from possessions, not from money, uh, not from power, not from jobs, uh, not from governments, not from churches. Our hope is not derived from those things. Our hope comes from a place that cannot disappoint. Um, And so we've got a lot to learn from this chapter, but the emphasis on this is that hope does not disappoint us. And if it can disappoint you, whatever it is, it's not worthy of your hope or your expectations. Now, this is where I need you to nod with me for a second. Do you understand what I'm saying? You getting this? Okay, now, because here's the big point of the lesson. And the big point of the lesson is this, and no, it's not over yet. I've got a bit more to say. Um, We are loved by a God who meets us in our most difficult places. We are loved by a God who meets us in our most difficult places. We are loved by a God who joins us in our darkest hours. We are loved by a God who loves us and joins us in our darkest hours. And when we are filled with disappointments over the conditions of this life, God still shows up. God continues to show up because we are loved by a God who brings us endless hope. Now, why would I call it endless hope? Why would I call it that? Well, I got a little bit more to share with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, As you're turning there, The reason I call it this is because the kind of hope that God provides is hope for every moment of this life, and it is also hope for every moment of the next life, which goes on forever and ever and ever. God is the God of all hope, and that hope is for here, and that hope is for all of eternity. And so we hope for everything in this life to be fulfilled by God, and we hope for everything in the next life to be fulfilled by God. And so what does he say? He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, before this in chapter 13, he makes a point about love and he says that now abide these three things. Remember what he says? Faith and then hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. Well, why? Well, because right now in this life, we need faith, right? And in this life, we need to be firmly rooted in this hope and expectation that God is going to be faithful and fulfill all of his promises. And we will one day not need faith and hope because it will all be fulfilled in Christ when he returns and we will be with God forever in this loving relationship. And so that's how he explains this. But listen to what he talks about in chapter 15. In chapter 15, he's dealing with a church that's decided that they're not too sure about the resurrection. And what that means is that they were debating back and forth over whether or not anyone would ever be raised from the dead. And so Paul brings this teaching to them. And in the teaching, he says that if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then we are hopeless, okay? We have no hope at all. Hope is rooted in this life and into the next through the resurrection of Jesus. So listen to how he says this, verse 16 and following. He says, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is, what's your Bible say? My Bible says worthless. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, then your your faith is worthless, you who are still in your sins. Uh, He says, Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. If you do not believe in the resurrection, then you have no hope, because our hope is firmly rooted and established upon Jesus who was risen from the dead. And so he says in the next verse, in verse 20, and this is where the hope begins again, he says, But now, what does it say? Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. And by asleep, he means those who have passed away, those who have died. And so if Jesus is not raised from the dead, then Jesus is not Lord. And if Jesus is not Lord, then there is no hope anywhere in this life or in the next life. But Christ has been raised from the dead. Now, I'm not here today to try to convince you that Jesus is raised from the dead. I'm assuming today that most of us, maybe even all of us gathered here today, believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. I sure hope that's the case. If it's not, I'd like to talk to you more about that. But but I'm, I'm not trying to persuade you that Jesus is risen from the dead. What I'm challenging you to do today is this. I'm challenging you to live like you believe that Jesus is alive from the dead. Now, it might sound kind of weird. I'm not trying to convince you that he is. I'm trying to challenge you to live Like you really believe that Jesus is alive from the dead. And what is the difference? Well, I mean, what's the difference between those two things? Well, there is often some distance between what we profess and what we practice. 
Right? If we had some time, we would chase this rabbit for a little while and we would uh, look at what the Bible says about being a hypocrite. A hypocrite is a person who says one thing and then does another. Uh, but there is a distance that we have between what we profess and what we actually practice. And how can we tell? Well, uh, often there are moments in our life that come along where we were hoping for something that didn't come to pass and we think, Everything is now hopeless. If our hope was in the resurrection and hope was for eternal life in Christ Jesus, what do we have to be disappointed about when those things don't actually come to pass? The reason we are struggling in those moments is because there's a dif difference and some distance between what we profess and what we actually practice. Um, in Hebrews chapter 10, if you'll turn there with me, please. Hebrews chapter 10. This is a, a great chapter, by the way. Most of my life I, I've uh, been taught this chapter. The emphasis has been on verse 25. Most of the time, don't forsake the assembling of the saints together, as is the habit of some, right? But the, 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 the context of that is actually an, an, an amazing context. Listen to what he says in verse 19. He says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, like we get to be in the presence of God because of the blood of Jesus. Powerful, powerful stuff. And he says, By a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second because if we were to go ahead a little bit and read chapter 11, he would say in the beginning that faith is the assurance of things what? Things that are hoped for, right? Faith is, faith is an assurance of things that are hoped for. And why can we have assurance about things that are hoped for? And the entire next chapter is about, about this. God makes promises God fulfills promises. God has never failed. God will never fail. That's the whole point of chapter 11. In everyone's life that he, that he gives as an example, he shows that they had faith, and because of their faith, they went to their graves trusting that God was going to do what he promised to do, and God always comes through and fulfills his promises. And so he says, we have this sense of heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Listen to this right here. This is, you could maybe even write this down. Highlight it in your Bible. Do something to mark it. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? For he who promised is faithful. Um, when I say that there's a distance between what we profess and what we practice, uh, maybe a way to resolve that is to listen to what he has to say here. Let's hold fast to our confession of hope without wavering because he who promises faithful. Um, and what is your confession? What, what is your confession? Uh, do you remember when you were baptized? Do you remember years ago or maybe moments ago, whenever it was in your life? Uh, just this last Thursday night, I had the honor of baptizing a guy named Chris that I've been studying with for a little while. And uh, Chris made a confession. And as I asked him before he was baptized, I said, do you believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He said, yes, I do. And he was immersed and raised up to new life. His sins were washed away. One of the things that we do when we are baptized is we confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Another way of saying that in the Bible is to say that Jesus is Lord, right? And so when we say Jesus is Lord, that's our confession. That's the confession that I live with in, in every aspect of my life. Each and every circumstance of life is an opportunity for you to be confessional, for you to say that Jesus is Lord. Uh, when everything in your life is falling apart, there's an opportunity in the middle of your darkest hour, in the middle of your most difficult moments, for you to say and confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, we can chase this for a little while, but if your marriage is falling apart and things are getting really difficult and you don't know where to go with it, what do you say in those moments? You can say, it's all going to be okay. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. Lord. When you're about to lose your job, or maybe you're about to lose your house, or maybe you've lost something that was dear to you, and, and you're wondering, how am I going to get through this? It's a confessional moment, because in that moment, you can say with confidence, it's all going to be okay. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. When the country that you live in is falling apart, you can say, it's going to be okay. Why? Help me out. Because Jesus is Lord. When the world we live in is a mess, and wow, is it a mess, right? We can say with confidence it's all going to be okay. Why? Because Jesus 
is Lord. When your church is falling apart. Okay, so let's, let's talk about that for a second. I go to church uh, for many reasons. Two of them is so that I can be reminded about, uh, about hope, right? I come and I worship with people and I, I live life out in a community with people in a congregation so that you can remind me and I can remind you that there is hope in Jesus Christ. And I also do it because in that same community, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to betray each other and we're going to hurt each other. We're going to say things we shouldn't say and we're going to do things we shouldn't do and we're going to be let down by one another because the Bible never tells us to put hope in the church right? But it's a place where I'm reminded quite often that I need hope and that that hope is in Christ and not in anything else. See, the, the church reminds us of all these things. It's going to be okay. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. We will either live by our confession that Jesus is Lord or we will live without hope. Several times a year for the last 30 years, uh, I've been in ministry now for about 30 years, Several times a year for the last 30 years, I've stood in places just like this. In fact, a week ago, I stood right here um, and did a funeral, I did a lot of funerals. And um, I help families say goodbye to their loved ones. And it's under a lot of different circumstances, and I can go on and on about all the different kinds of funerals that I've been a part of doing. But many of those funerals are filled with endless hope, and I love to do those funerals. Uh, I'm not happy that that person has passed away. Uh, I'm happy that that person has had, uh, had, had endless hope in their life because they believe that Jesus is Lord. And I love to do those funerals because I can stand here and I can say several things with confidence. Uh, but there are other funerals that I do, many, many other funerals that I do where I stand in front of people and I, I, I don't feel that kind of joy. I, I stand in front of people uh, who are not filled with great expectations from God and they are not filled with endless hope. Many of the funerals that I do are for non-believers and this may be hard to hear, uh, but let me be very clear. Many of the funerals I do are for the hopeless and I do that for the hopeless in front of a family that looks at that dif difficult situation, maybe the most difficult thing we ever deal with in life and I don't have joy to share with them in that moment because that person was not a believer. I can let them know that God loves them. I can let them know that God is not the author of their pain. I can let them know that God is the author of salvation. I can let them know that there is hope in Jesus, but I cannot tell them that their loved one is with the Lord, and I cannot tell them that everything is going to be okay, and I cannot tell them that any hope remains for those who die without Jesus. Uh, just a, a few years ago, there was a, a funeral that I, I did here. Uh, some of you might remember there was a car accident over here on 36. And a um, person was drinking and driving, and they pulled onto 36, going the wrong way on, on 36. And as they pulled on, on, onto the highway on the off-ramp, they went headlong into some people. They killed a family. Uh, the driver, uh, a woman, uh, was inebriated, and she was injured badly. Her boyfriend that was in the, the vehicle beside her was, was killed. And um, the family asked uh, us to do the funeral, and, and we did the funeral for this, this young man. And uh, it was so, so difficult. There were lots and lots of tears, and everybody was very, very, uh, very, very upset. Um, I had to go through the slideshow of this young man, and I had to edit out pornographic pictures that he had inside of this uh, slideshow that were memories of his life. I had to edit out uh, uh, profanities. I had to edit out some things that were just, just too awful for us to show in any place, much less in this place. Uh, in almost every single picture, he and his family were holding bottles of alcohol in almost every single picture. And they were remembering his life for what he had placed his hope in. And it was hopeless in that moment. It was very hard to do those funerals. Um, what kind of funeral will your funeral be like? What are people going to say at your funeral? How are people going to remember your funeral? Um, at my funeral, I want people to sing a song. Well, maybe more than one song. I'd like there to be a lot of tears, okay? I like people to cry because I, I am your dearly departed, okay? Um, but at my funeral, I want them to sing a song. And at that song, I want them to be thinking of me and, and believing that this is true, and I want it to be true. And the song goes like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I'm going to leave you today not with a prayer. I normally leave you with a prayer, but today I want to leave you with a blessing. And this blessing comes from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 15. 
And he says this to this church as he's wrapping up his thoughts with them in, in his letter in Romans. He says, Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here, everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here, he breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. <clears throat> the one seen, he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing. <clears throat> we'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> In our daily Bible reading recently, we read about a fellow called Melchizedek. In Hebrews chapter 7, Melchizedek is compared to Christ. Uh, I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 14. Hebrews 7. Verse 14, for it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of of an indestructible life. For it is declared in, in Psalm 110, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> so um, in, in reading our daily Bible, I, I noticed another similarity between Melchizedek and Christ. And um, 
was on January 5th, we read from Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. It says there, um, after Abram had defeated the kings, it says, Genesis 14, 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. Okay? So you see that Melchizedek was a servant leader, like our Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't Abram serving bread and wine to Melchizedek. It was vice versa. And that is what uh, Jesus did when he introduced the Lord's Supper. That is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So as we partake this morning, let us remember our servant leader Jesus and also consider how we can serve him in this coming new week. Shall we pray? Our God and Heavenly Father, we praise you, Father, for your love and uh, for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. We um, <clears throat> thank you for this bread, which represents Jesus' body. And uh, we recognize that he used his body on this earth to seek and save the lost. And we pray, Father, that uh, uh, we might serve him by influencing others in confessing Christ. And uh, please be with each person here today that is partaking and remembering Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Let us pray again. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your uh, plan of salvation that you had in mind before the beginning of time. We thank you, Father, for, for Jesus and his sacrifice. We thank you for his soul-cleansing blood shed on Calvary for taking away our sins. Ask your blessing now on this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood. And again, Father, please be with each person that is partaking and remembering. In Jesus' name, amen.
until my slideshows get done, they're kind of a living document. <laughs> and uh, if I don't get that last upload right, things are going to be different. So apologize for that. The next song is number 38, Awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns with heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Number 538, My Hope is Built. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, Fault less to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you for being here today. I said I wasn't gonna do this, but I'm not, I've been accused of being a real smart guy anyway. I can't tell you how my heart was fluttering when we were sitting down before Andy began. It is so good to see you. Andy, on your absolute worst day of your life as a song leader, you'll be a hundred times better than my best day that I would have ever had. Don't worry about this. I'm glad to see you. Listening to Sam's messages online is great, but I am so glad to see you. I am so glad to see you. Our God has blessed us. We've had trial through this year. Many of you have had family that's had all kind of suffering. But God has blessed us, and he is with us. And if it's his will, as we move through this year, we can get rid of these silly things. My glasses won't fog up anymore. And I can hug you and take your hand. But until then, for your sake, as well as mine, I just so value seeing your face. I hope you know that's coming from my heart because I did not plan to say this, but I can't feel anything 
but overflowed with joy this morning. <laughs> if coming to church feels like that, can you imagine what it's going to be when we see each other in heaven? I want to ask you, for the sake of everyone, as we exit today, we'll leave by row, starting with the back row, and I ask that you uh, move out and, and don't stop. If you need to go to the restroom, that's great, but if somebody's with you, please proceed outside, and uh, it's a beautiful day, so if you choose to stand and talk, please do so, but I ask you one thing. Don't stand underneath that driveway and jerk your mask off because other people have got to come by you and some people have more risk than you maybe. And also there'll be others coming in. But the main reason we need to clear the building is because we got volunteers that's got to disinfect for our next group coming in. So I need to hush, but it is so good to look at your face. Even though I only see your eyes, I know what the other half looks like. <laughs> Let's go to God in prayer and finish this day morning together. Righteous Father, we pour out our hearts to you. You are the God of the Bible. You are Jehovah God, the only God that wasn't created by man's imagination. You created us. And Father God, you not only created us, but you made us in your image and you redeemed us from our sins by sending your Son, our Lord and Savior, our King, our Prince, to come and suffer and to be offered as a sacrifice to atone our sins. Father, what could we ever say what in our human voice, our hearts, could ever say to equal how we feel of being together and celebrating you as our God and Jesus as our Lord. Thank you for Sam's message. You are our hope. Christ is our hope. We have nothing else. And Father, if this last 10 months hasn't taught us anything, is Father, by nature, we're selfish, and Father, you are in control, and the only thing that has any power in this world is you. And we humbly and gratefully worship that God of power and love and mercy. Father, thank you for letting us be together. Thank you for seeing each family through this trying time. And Father, may it be your will that we can return to what we think of as normal as soon as possible. Protect those that are here. Protect the ones we love, Father, because you are all we need. You are all we ever need. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.